Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one that I truly feel everyone will have differing opinions on. It is still an ongoing case, but we do have a good bit of information to form opinions on. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation that is had in the comments after the video. But before we get into it, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to Nicole B, Nicole S, and Matt for being a part of the Patreon family. I truly cannot express how much I appreciate your support from each and every one of you. From the very bottom of my heart, thank you all so, so very much for your support. With that being said, let's get into the case. Today, we are going to be discussing the case of John O'Keefe. John O'Keefe was born and raised in Braintree, Massachusetts. He went to Braintree High School before attending Northeastern University in Boston, before attending University of Massachusetts and earning his master's degree in criminal justice. Then he worked for 16 years at the Boston Police Department. In November of 2013, Brian's sister unfortunately suddenly passed away, and just a short time after that, in January of 2014, his brother-in-law passed away as well. The couple had two children, Kaylee and Patrick, so John decided to take in his niece and nephew and raise them as his own, becoming their legal guardian. It was said that he literally built the life for them based off of their needs, not his own. Those who knew John said that he literally was the type of guy who would give you the shirt off of his back when you needed it, and that was clear with his actions here. He was overall known as a kind person who was dedicated to his family and his career in law enforcement. At the time of his death, 46-year-old John was dating a 42-year-old woman named Karen Reed, being together for about two years. As of right now, we don't know a ton about the quality of the relationship between the two, but there are some details that I will discuss later that give us a little bit of insight into how things had been between them. Either way, it was on Friday, January 18th, 2022, when Karen and John went to a local bar in Canton called C.F. McCarthy's Bar with a group of friends to get some drinks that night. Many of the interactions when they were out were captured on surveillance video, so police were able to put together a timeline of that night, even though I have not personally seen that footage. Either way, at 7.37 p.m., John is seen arriving at the bar, and by 8.51 p.m., Karen is seen joining them at the bar. Between the times of 8.58 p.m. and 10.22 p.m., it appears that Karen had six drinks and one shot, so seven drinks total. By 10.40 p.m., Karen and John are seen leaving the bar, with Karen still holding her last drink in her hand as they exit. By 10.54 p.m., Karen and John are seen arriving at the Waterfall Bar and Grill in Canton together to get more drinks and to watch some live music. They stay there for about an hour, and I didn't see how many drinks they had or really what they did there, so my assumption is that they probably just didn't have surveillance cameras in that bar, so we don't know exactly what happened. But either way, the couple were seen at this bar for about an hour before Karen is seen leaving the bar with two other women through the front door at 12.10 a.m. Then, a few moments after Karen leaves, John is seen taking a quick sip from his drink before heading out the door, still carrying the glass in his hand. So again, we know that John at least had one drink, he may have had more, Karen may have continued drinking here, she may not have, we don't exactly know. Either way, one minute later at 12.11 a.m., John is seen walking out, still carrying the glass, and then meeting up with Karen outside of the bar. Then, the two walk together towards Washington Street. At that point, witnesses said that neither Karen or John appeared to be drunk or overly intoxicated at that point. By 12.14 a.m., John sends a text to a man named Brian. We will talk more about Brian in just a second. But the text says where to, and then Brian's sister, Jennifer, sent him a text with an address. This address was for a home on Fairview Road, and it was a house that Brian owned. I believe that Brian is also a police officer, and that John and Jennifer, his sister, had been friends for a long time. 
Again, Brian owned the house on Fairview Drive and Jennifer was either his sister or a sister-in-law. I'm not exactly sure. That wasn't totally clear. It was reported differently depending on the source that you looked at. But Jennifer was the one texting John, keeping him up to date on where to go. By 12.15 a.m., an SUV that appears to belong to Karen is seen traveling on the road past Canton Town Library, and then they drive around for about three minutes before John calls Jennifer at 12.18 a.m., to ask them for more specific directions on where to go. By 12.31 a.m., John got a text to his phone from Jennifer. This message just says, hello. By 12.40 a.m., John gets another text message from Jennifer saying, pull up behind me. This text is referencing her car, which was in the driveway. After sending that message, Jennifer watches from her house as the SUV moves from where it was originally parked, which was near the driveway, to now being on the left side of the property near a flagpole and a fire hydrant. By 12.45 a.m., Jennifer sent John another text message just saying hello again. After that, she watched as the SUV drove away. So basically what was happening here was that this group of friends all went bar hopping it seems and then they were going to do another get together at Brian's house. But Karen said that she didn't want to go because she was having stomach problems. So she dropped John off and then turned around and went home with two other friends who then went to where Karen was going to be. However, in the hours after dropping John off, Karen realized that she was not getting any responses from John. She had been texting and calling him, but he was not answering. At the same time, the friends at the home also realized that John had never come inside for the get-together. Sometime between 1.30 and 2 a.m. though, they did notice what looked like a dark object in the snow by the flagpole across the street from the home, but they weren't really sure exactly what it was and they didn't go outside to check it out or anything like that. By 4.53 a.m., John's niece called Jennifer asking her if she had seen John. Jennifer told Kaylee that the last time she saw John was when Karen and John left that waterfall bar together. Then by 5 a.m., Karen called another one of her friends saying that John never came home that night and she was starting to get worried. According to later court documents, Karen said something like, I wonder if he's dead, it's snowing, I wonder if he got hit by a plow. She then told her friend that she didn't remember a lot from what happened that night, so she was really worried about what could have possibly happened. By 5.11 a.m., Video surveillance captured Karen's black SUV traveling onto Washington Street towards the waterfall bar, and then four minutes later, the same camera sees the car traveling in the opposite direction, now away from the waterfall bar. So it seems like she went over by that area to see if he was there. He wasn't, so she turned around and left. By 5.30 a.m., Karen and the friend who was with her that night, they both showed up to the home on Fairview Road. According to Jennifer, Karen was hysterical at that point. So, one of Karen's friends drove her back to her house while another friend followed behind them in their own car. So again, this part, again, isn't totally clear, but I believe at this point, the friend is now driving Karen's car with Karen in the passenger seat, while the other friend, who I believe is Jennifer, followed behind them in her own car. Apparently, during the ride back home, Karen was saying to the friend who was driving in the SUV, could I have hit him? Did I hit him? And then she told the friend that she did crack the taillight on her SUV. Then all the women arrived at John's house, which is where I believe Karen was staying that night or she lived with John at the house. Again, not 100% sure. But either way, at the house, Karen showed the two women the cracked taillight on her SUV and then all three women got into the same car and started driving around looking for John. As they were driving, one of the friends noted that it was snowing very heavily and there was very poor visibility. But as they were driving, it seemed that Karen almost immediately spotted John lying in the snow 
in a spot that the other women were not able to see from the car due to the low visibility. So Karen pointed John out and then the women got out of the car and they found that John was lying on the side of the road by that fire hydrant and flag post near where the SUV was seen dropping off John just hours earlier. When they found John, he was lying in the snow unresponsive. Immediately, Karen rushed over to John and began to attempt CPR on him, and by 6.04 a.m., 911 received a call to report that a man was found unconscious in the snow. By the time police arrived, they found that the three women were all surrounding John's body, with Karen's face and hands just being covered in blood after attempting CPR. Police noted when they found him that John was cold to the touch and he was not breathing. His body looked to be a bit mangled with a deep blue swollen black eye and deep cuts to his arms, as well as other bruises and trauma all over his body. At the time on the police body cam footage, it shows conditions outside were dark, snowing, and there was a blizzard, so again, very poor visibility. Then, one of the firefighters who responded to the scene reportedly heard Karen telling her friend repeatedly, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. By 7.50 a.m., unfortunately, after multiple attempts at saving his life, Officer John O'Keefe was pronounced dead. Of course, after this, there needed to be an investigation into what could have happened. So, after the discovery of John's body, Karen went to get her blood drawn and underwent a toxicology screen. Results of that found that Karen's blood alcohol level was around 0.07 to 0.08%, which meant that around 12.45 a.m. when she was seen driving her car and dropping off John, her blood alcohol level could have been somewhere between 0.13 and 0.29 percent, which of course is far higher above the legal limit for driving. So this shows that hours before, she most likely was driving under the influence. That same day on January 29th, officers investigating the scene arrived to the home where Karen was and saw that the taillight on her SUV was in fact shattered. So, the SUV was then seized by the Canton Police Department, and then the officers went to the area where John's body was found, and there, they dug through the snow and found two pieces of red plastic taillight and one piece of clear plastic taillight in the snow. And allegedly, these pieces of plastic taillight were consistent with Karen's SUV. Police also examined her SUV, which first showed that her backup camera on the car was working properly at the time. They also ran a test to see if the car would alert the technicians to a dummy if they had backed up to a dummy, and it showed that it did alert them, so it was functioning properly. So basically what that's saying is that if she relied on her backup camera and it usually alerted her to when something was there, and this time in particular it didn't alert her, that could explain why she may have accidentally backed up and hit something, but this test showed that that wasn't the case, that everything was working properly, so when she was backing up, if she did hit John, then it should have alerted her and she should have obviously been aware that she hit him. Then police report that they also did find human hair on the rear of the vehicle. Then police did do a forensic examination of Karen's cell phone. Now, this cell phone examination has been a big point of contention for a lot of people. Some sources state that the forensic examination revealed evidence of a strained relationship between the two of them. There are reports that show that Karen wanted to end things with John, that they were in a toxic relationship that wasn't good for Karen, John, or the children. However, this is something that has been heavily debated, so I will discuss a little bit more about this in just a few minutes. So, based on all of the evidence that police found by February 1st of 2022, Karen was arrested and charged with manslaughter and second-degree murder for the death of her boyfriend, John, as well as driving under the influence and leaving the scene of an accident. The prosecution theorized that on the night of January 29th, 2022, Karen dropped John off at the friend's house and then did a three-point turn 
and while doing so, she hit John with the SUV and then left him to die in the snow. The friends that John was supposed to meet up with backed that story, saying that John never entered the home after he was supposed to that night. At the hearing, she pled not guilty to all charges and she was given a $50,000 bail, which she posted and now she is awaiting her trial at home. However, Karen's defense team actually points the blame for this at Jennifer and Brian. The defense is arguing that Brian or somebody else in the home beat John to death and that Brian's dog, a German shepherd named Chloe, also attacked John. It was said that Brian was a trained boxer and that his family had deep ties to the Canton Police Department and the Massachusetts State Police. They argued that the injuries sustained are not consistent with being hit and run over with a car. It looks like he was severely beaten. And just to note, the dog Chloe has been rehomed since the night of John's death and there could be some evidence right now that could support this entire theory. Of course, after John's body was discovered, he was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. The medical examiner ruled that John's manner of death could not be determined, but his cause of death was ruled as blunt impact injuries to the head and hypothermia. Some evidence on the autopsy report shows that John may have been severely beaten. He had injuries to both sides of his face as well as to the back of his head, and like I mentioned earlier, he did have a black eye. Then there were wounds on John's arms, these very deep cuts that were all down his arms that could be consistent with several dog bites. So, Karen's defense said in her initial hearing that they think that the prosecution, as well as Brian and Jennifer, are going to great lengths to suppress evidence that can exonerate Karen. They genuinely believe that if they had access to the cell phone data, that it would exonerate Karen. So first, the defense talked about how the prosecution has been in possession of Karen's phone for over a year at this point, and they are not turning over the evidence that they are finding. They said that they haven't produced any text message or other data to show that there was any strain on the relationship between the couple. They haven't released any location data that could show whether or not John ever went inside of the home while Karen drove away or if he truly ever made it inside of the home. Karen's lawyers even brought up evidence at the hearing saying that there is a Google search made from Jennifer's phone at 2.27 a.m. on the 29th, which was for how long to die in the cold, but then this search was intentionally deleted right after the search was made. So obviously the question is why would Jennifer be making this Google search around the same time that it's possible that John was lying in the snow and dying from the cold. But the prosecution said that the defense might have the timestamp wrong and that she made the search long after John's body was already found. They said that what really happened was that Jennifer made a search at 2.27 a.m. for her daughter's basketball team, but then used that same open tab to search for information on hypothermia hours later after 6 a.m. when John's body was found. The prosecution said, quote, that subsequent Google search that you're doing is going to reflect in the phone as being done when the website was first visited, when Google was first visited hours earlier. That is what happened in this particular case. But the defense rejected that argument saying, quote, more than one web page can be open on a cell phone at any given time. The court knows this. Everyone who owns a cell phone knows this. The 227 how long to die in cold search was nanoseconds, milliseconds before the basketball search came up. The page came up after the dying in the cold search was deleted on Jennifer's phone and as soon as the page was deleted, the other basketball page behind it was immediately populating on the screen and when I say immediately, not the same time, nanoseconds behind. Then the prosecution said that she didn't intentionally delete the data from the search, that the data just wasn't restored so it's sort of just deleted on its own, but of course the defense said that this stuff just doesn't delete by itself, that those deletions were made by her. In fact, the defense says that they have cell phone evidence that does support that John entered the home that night, 
saying that they think there's evidence that John took several steps long after it had been thought that he was killed. The defense was requesting subpoenas to look at Brian and Jennifer's home, but the judge denied the request and denied the defense access to their phones. The defense also brought up how conveniently after John is found dead and after it's thought that he was attacked by the dog, the family decided to rehome the family dog of seven years. This is making it a lot more difficult to find the dog to examine it to see if the bite marks match up and if it's possible that the dog could have been responsible for those injuries on his arm. So, why after John is found dead, if there's nothing to hide, if the dog is not involved, if, you know, it has nothing to do with this whole situation, why are you going to rehome your dog after having it for seven years? If my friend was hit by a car after leaving my home, how does that connect to me getting rid of my dog? It doesn't. That makes absolutely no sense. There's no reason to get rid of your dog in that situation. So that looks really bad. So as of right now, one side is saying that there's plenty of evidence to show that Karen drove her car while intoxicated, dropped John off, and backed up and hit John with the car, killing him, leaving him to die at the scene. So with the supporting evidence being that, you know, the backup camera and the alert system was working, so it would have shown her that she did hit John and she left anyways, then in the hours and day after he was found, she allegedly admitted to hitting him. The defense claims though that John was attacked and the prosecution and others are all working to cover up evidence, all in a plot to make Karen look guilty. They said that asking the court order on this data from the cell phone is not a fishing expedition. They said that the defense team has, quote, already uncovered significant steps to delete and tamper with evidence that was provided to law enforcement and misrepresent what occurred on the night in question in an attempt to interfere with the investigation into O'Keefe's death. The defense also brought forward how some of the officers who were at the scene and who are investigating are close friends with Brian and Jennifer. There have been some photos where one of the primary investigators on this case was one of the groomsmen at Jennifer's wedding, and one of the investigator's family members was the ring bearer in her wedding. These photos were taken in May of 2012, and then photos from July of 2016 and August of 2017 show photos of the same investigator at a family gathering with some members of Jennifer's family. So, clearly, there is some connection here. There's some conflict of interest here. So, the defense questions why after John was literally found dead on the property that Brian owned, why was he not treated like a suspect? Is it because him and Jennifer are close friends with the investigating officers? Karen has come out to talk to the public after months of silence. She said that she feels like she's the only one fighting for the truth of what really happened to John. She said that her and her team are doing everything they can to get the truth. They said that they know who spearheaded this cover-up and that she was the one trying to save his life. She said that when police showed up, she was covered in blood from trying to save her boyfriend's life. Said it feels we're the only ones fighting for the truth of what happened to John O'Keefe. And me and my family and my attorneys and my team have marshaled every resource to get to the truth. It just feels like no one else wants it. And Karen, just to be clear, you didn't do it. We know who did it, Steve. We know. And we know who spearheaded this cover-up. You all know. Yes, we do. And no, she didn't do it. No, she didn't do it. This is an innocent woman. She didn't do it. I tried to save his life. Yeah. I tried to save his life at six in the morning. I was covered in his blood. I was the only one trying to save his life. Why do you admit to it? He didn't, she didn't admit to it. She didn't admit to anything close to that. Nothing close to that. And you should know that. I was like three or four times she admitted to it. No, no, she didn't. That's not true. She asked a question. She asked a question, which is very different. She I didn't admit to point. anything. But through all of this, through all of these hearings and statements and all of that, the prosecution has basically said that the defense has not brought forward any evidence to show that anything would have been exculpatory. 
They said that the accusations they are making are completely baseless and are not rooted in fact. I wanted to talk about some of the questions that others have asked as well as questions that I have. After this hearing, some people have questioned Karen why she would have admitted multiple times throughout this that she may have hit John. Her lawyers have said that she didn't actually admit to hitting anyone but I will say that different people did report her hearing that, so it's not just like, you know, Jennifer and Brian heard her saying that. It was one of her friends as well as a paramedic that showed up on the scene, and to me, I feel like she probably did say it. But to play devil's advocate, I think that if she did say that, she wasn't necessarily admitting that she hit him. It could have been that maybe she hit the light post or the fire hydrant and that that is why those pieces of the taillight were missing. And after finding John's body, maybe she really thought that she hit him. She could have been in such a state of panic worrying about what happened to him, you know, when he wasn't responding and when he wasn't coming home and that, you know, when she went out looking for him and after finding him, that in that moment, she questioned herself and if she did hit him. We know that she didn't have the best memory of what happened that night. And in my opinion, I think that because of that and the fact that she had so many drinks, she definitely should not have been driving. And I do think she was driving under the influence. So I do think those charges should stick. But I do think it's reasonable that if she hit the light post and saw, you know, the next day, like, oh my gosh, there's damage on my car my boyfriend is missing, that she might conclude in her head that maybe she did hit him. And again, she finds him lying unconscious, this person that she loves, this person that she's close with that didn't show up at home and now he's injured. She could be thinking, oh my god, I caused this. I hit him. This is horrible. But again, it doesn't necessarily mean that she's the one that hit him. Then when it came to her somehow finding John's body in low visibility, you know, like I said earlier, they're like, how did you know that he was right there even though we can't see him from the car? As we know, she did drive to the other bar before coming to this location, but it could also be reasonable to say that she was intentionally looking in the spot where she knew she dropped him off. Again, if she thought that maybe she hit him or if she thought like, where's another place to look where I dropped him off? it would make sense to look in that area. I think that's very reasonable that, okay, I dropped this person off on this corner. It was snowy. It was really bad out. Let me go look in that same spot to see if he's still there. I don't think that that's suspicious. So to me, based on the information that we know, I don't think that there is necessarily enough information to confidently say that Karen truly ran John over and that she purposely left him there to die. I think that the injuries that he had are huge red flags that something else could have happened. If someone was run over by a car, I just don't see how that would cause a black eye and all of those scratches and deep cuts on his arm. He probably would have blunt force, bruising, maybe some scuff marks on his clothes or on his, you know, body if his clothes came up. But I don't think that those deep cuts and scratch marks and a black eye would have been caused just by her backing into him as she was making a three-point turn. The car wouldn't have even been going fast enough to cause such severe injuries that his body would have been completely mangled unless she backed over him, her tires went over him, and then she like turned on him and then drove away, which I guess is possible, but there's just not enough evidence to say that that is what happened. When it comes to her running him over, I guess, when it comes to just a relationship in general, I guess we do have a motive because we don't know for 100% certain that the relationship between John and Karen was good. We don't know if it was bad either though. There haven't been any witnesses to say that they were arguing that night. There hasn't been any physical evidence on the phone or anything that's been released that says that they had this really toxic relationship. Again, a lot of people will just look at a couple and say, well, we don't know how things were. We don't know if things were good. We don't know if things were bad. But at the same time, you can't just assume that someone had a bad toxic relationship just because someone in that relationship was hurt if you don't know what exactly caused it. 
At the same time, though, we don't have a motive for Brian or Jennifer either. Were they good friends? It seemed like they were, so what could have possibly happened that caused some sort of fight between them enough for Brian or someone else to want to beat that person to death. There just, again, isn't enough information right now to say if maybe John and Brian got into a fight that night for whatever reason, or maybe him and Jennifer got into a fight. There's literally no evidence right now to say that John had issues with any of the people involved, including Karen. I also do think that the Google search of how long does it take to die in the cold is very, very concerning. I personally don't think that the defense got that timestamp mixed up. I think it's pretty cut and dry these days to see when someone made a search for something. The technology is pretty good and our phones and search engines pretty much track every single thing that we do. So I think it's absolutely possible that she made that search at the time that it said, quickly realized that it looked bad and then immediately deleted it and searched her daughter's basketball team so that maybe the other search wouldn't show up or that it would cover for that search and that they wouldn't see it. The other question that I have about this night is that if John was supposed to show up to Brian's house after Jennifer and John had been texting back and forth about the plans and Jennifer saw that the car showed up, parked, and then left, why didn't Jennifer text John? Why wouldn't she text him saying, hey, where are you going? Are you still coming? Or something like that. If an hour or two had passed and I hadn't heard from John, who again was supposed to be coming over just minutes before or an hour before at that point, I probably would follow up to make sure that they made it home safe or to ask what happened or why they decided not to come. The fact that it doesn't seem that Jennifer ever reached out to John after literally making plans with him, calling and texting with him about showing up, seeing the car show up, and then leaving without saying anything is very suspicious to me. I know that personally, if I had a friend that was coming over to my house for a get together, I saw their car show up in my, you know, front window and I saw them on the street and then I saw them turn around and leave, I would text them almost right away to see what happened to say, hey, I know you were coming over, you said you were on the way, you're still not here, or I saw you turn around, what happened? Again, especially if we already had plans of them coming over. Again, the fact that nobody reached out to John after he didn't show up, after seeing the car literally turn around and go home, that's very suspicious to me. Based off of the evidence that we do have with the injuries that he had and the other suspicious circumstances, this might be a hot take, but I do not think that Karen is guilty, or at least I don't think that there's enough evidence to show that she is. And I think it's honestly wild that we have almost more information that shows towards Jennifer and or Brian than we see from Karen. Like there's almost no evidence to show that Karen actually hit him specifically. Again, other than maybe the hair on the back of her car, that looks pretty bad. But broken taillight doesn't mean that she hit someone. It means that she hit something doesn't mean that she hit him. And the fact that just like, I guess they didn't have the best relationship. That's really all that there is to show that Karen is guilty. But when it comes to Brian and Jennifer, we have a Google search. We have, you know, lack of them reaching out and other suspicious behaviors. And we have the fact that they rehomed their dog right after his body was found. I think it's crazy that the police have not looked more into Brian and Jennifer. And I think it's absolutely possible that due to their ties in the police department, that there could be some sort of cover-up going up. I think it's entirely possible that there was a beating and that they literally may have seen Karen do this three-point turn and maybe even saw her bump into a light post or a fire hydrant. So they decided to frame her by putting John's body in that same spot knowing that Karen would probably think that she hit him. Because again, if I was driving and I, you know, probably shouldn't have been, definitely shouldn't have been, again, don't condone driving under the influence. I think it's one of the worst things that you could possibly do. But if I was driving and let's say I was very tired or something, because I would never drive under the influence, but let's say I was very tired and I went home and, you know, my friend or significant other that I was driving with didn't show up and... I saw that I had a broken taillight and then I went back to that area and saw that that person was lying there, I would absolutely think that I hit them even if I didn't. 
So I think that they knew that. I think that they knew she would feel guilty if that same situation happened. And I think that it's very possible that they framed her for this. So that is what I think. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what you all think about this as well. I think that there is a lot here to say that the prosecution and police need to look more into these other people that could be involved. And I don't think there's enough to say that Karen for sure is guilty. But those are just my thoughts. We are still very early in this whole process. And of course, if there is a trial, more will come out. I'm really looking forward to seeing if there really is evidence on those cell phones. The defense sure seems to think that there's not because they haven't, you know, released that information after over a year. So I'm really looking forward to see if any more information comes out. And as that does happen, I will keep you all updated. But that is all I have for today's video. And now I want to know what you all think. Do you think that Karen hit John with her car and left him to die? Do you think that there was this bad toxic relationship between them? Or do you think that John was beaten and left there by his supposed friends? What do you think the motive was in either of these cases? And what do you think about his injuries? And what do you think about the defense's allegations that the prosecution is holding back evidence? Let's discuss all of this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Don't forget to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and fill out the Google form that I have listed down below as well. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!